Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Hollis Mickey, the Chief Learning and Access Officer at the Anchorage Museum, and I'm so thrilled to be able to welcome you to our virtual Rasmussen Foundation Individual Artist Award Professional Development Panel. This is focused on addressing the application process. And we have with us this afternoon esteemed former panelists from the Rasmussen Foundation uh, Individual Artist Award process. Before we get started and I go over some details for today's program, I want to take a moment for a land acknowledgement. Wherever you are, I'd like to take time to honor and acknowledge the indigenous peoples of the place where you live and work. For me here in Anchorage, I am an uninvited guest on the lands of the Eklutna Denaina people where the Anchorage Museum is situated. The Anchorage Museum opens each program with a moment of land acknowledgement as a part of a process of ongoing truth telling and recognition of the histories of museums and presence of museums as part of colonization. Thank you. Um, so with that, I'm just going to briefly um, say the names of our panelists today who can indicate themselves and maybe we can uh, become big. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so again, I'm Hollis and I'm from the Anchorage Museum and uh, we have Anne Finger with us today. We have Michael Hammond. We have Sharon von Starkenberg. Starkenberg. I knew I'd mess it up. <laughs> and Anika Tanay. Thank you so much, all of you, for taking time in various time zones to be with us today and share your expertise and insight and anecdote about uh, applications to arti artist um, opportunities. So with that, um, because we're going to be um, populating the chat with bios um, so folks can get a little bit of a sense of who you are, I also just wanted to ask you to share a little bit about who you are in relationship to artist grants, residencies, fellowship opportunities, and panels, perhaps um, your experience being on panels in the past or as an applicant, if that applies to you as well. Um, and if anyone would like to start, I'll hand the mic over to you. We'll go around all of us and share um, for this first question. Well, I'm happy to start. Hello, everyone. It's really an honor to be here. Um, my experience is as a panelist but also as a grant maker, um, I haven't applied for a grant as an artist, but so I am constantly thinking about how is this impacting the artist? What are we, these questions that we're asking, right? Um, so last year alone, and this is obviously because of the virtual opportunities, I was a panelist for individual artists for Indianapolis. I was a panelist for Rasmussen. I was a panel, and now I'm a panelist for the NEA. So it's really rich. And I was the, I, I live in the land of the Piscataway and Nakachunk in Arlington, Virginia. And I was the chair of the arts commission here. And so oversaw grants in that capacity. So I'm having like these local, state, regional, now national experiences, private foundation experiences. And um, it's been really rich. And I just try to put myself in the place of, as an artist, as a singer, um, what would I be looking for from a proposal? What are some of the barriers that um, applications present? So, Thank you. Thank you. And I'm happy to go next. Um, I've applied for innumerable residencies and grants, and most of them I don't get. Um, some of them I do get. And um, I have also served on, on panels, um, a number of panels. Um, even going back to, I was on the California Arts Council uh, panels um, years and years and years ago. 
and I had heard, oh, the UPS driver comes to your house for the applications and they have a hand truck that they bring them on. And I didn't believe them, but they really did have these boxes that were so big pre-internet days. Um, so it was, it's often a lot of work to be a panelist, but to me, it's been really valuable because I've really been able to think, okay, I'm writing this for somebody who doesn't know me, doesn't know my work, may not know the approach that I have to my work. And it's really been helpful for me to be a panelist and figure out how, how much the panelist needs to know um, and how, you, how much you need to guide the panelist through, your, um, through the narrative of your um, art project. Thank you. Aaron or Michael? Michael, yeah, go for it. All right. Uh, I'm not an artist. Uh, I'm an enabler. Uh, I've served on panels. Uh, I've been a curator numerous times for various art shows. Uh, primarily, uh, I've been director and director of tribal museums uh, that are startups. I've done construction of museums. Right now I'm living on the Agua Caliente Band of Cahuilla Indians Reservation. Uh, it's, and I have served on National Endowment for Humanities. I've served on the faculty of historic administration for Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, I've looked at proposals. I think I know what a good proposal is. And I question people who have reviewed my proposals because I thought it was a good proposal. Uh, but I've learned and uh, I hope that I can impart some wisdom to those who participate today. Thank you, Michael. And Sharon? Yeah, so I come to the panel as a practicing artist. I've been a professional artist for over 20 years. And um, so in that capacity, I've done many, many hundreds, maybe thousands applications to, um, to various bodies. So I come to uh, the panel as a peer assessor. Um, I, that, that is how I started. Um, I recently finished my MFA and I'm currently doing an MA. And so I've also been teaching and with more experience of being on juries and, and so on, um, that is how um, I approach and from sort of an empathetic, I think, approach as an artist, uh, what that has been like for so many years on that side and now experiencing it from the side of being on the panel. And uh, and it's been a very interesting for my own personal growth as an artist as well to know what that other side of it looks like and how, how I experience it. So. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. So I guess on that note, um, uh, this this notion of, um, you know, being on both sides, I think when you've only been on one side, if you've only been on the applying side, panels can seem quite mysterious about what goes on in them. And I wonder um, if any of you have insights about what you think some of the most common misconceptions are about panel review processes for applications. And again, not all of you need to address or respond, um, but if you feel compelled um, to share maybe some of your own experiences or previous misconceptions you might've had before being on a panel, um, I'd be so curious to hear. Well, I definitely have thoughts about that. Um, uh, I think having now been on juries and panels, uh, one of the things that I would say um, is a really important observation is that um, if your proposal is not accepted, it's not personal, you know, and um, very often when you are on a panel, you are rooting for people and there's there's a finite budget and you have to make choices and um, and it can be really heartbreaking as a panelist. 
Um, and the other thing that I think people that artists should 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 know when they're submitting is often the case that the hosting body they have a mandate. Um, and, and so when you're making selections, a lot of times the selections are fulfilling the mandates of the host. Um, so the, the choices that you make um, need to fit into those priority groups sometimes and that sort of thing. So um, there are so many things that the, the jury or the panel is thinking about and considering when they're looking at your applications. And I think as an artist, one of the things that I I was happy to learn was actually it's not personal um, if you get rejected and that um, the panel works really hard. There's a lot of debate, sometimes, um, you know, passionate debate. Um, a lot of thought goes into it, um, but it's finite. And so usually more people are going to get rejections than acceptances. Um, but most of all, to know that uh, that generally speaking, people are rooting for you. You know, the panel wants you to be successful. And if we could, we would probably want to give everybody uh, an opportunity. So I think that's really important to know um, that it's not a personal thing. Thanks so much, Sharon. The others have thoughts. And I see you unmuting, yeah. Yeah, I, I would just second that. I mean, there's always a point when I'm on a panel where I want to put my head down on the table and cry because I so want to give it to everybody or maybe not to everybody who's applied, but to everybody who's gotten to the finalist stage. And we know we're rejecting artists who do wonderful work and would make really valuable use of the monies we're able to give them. Um, and people really do think, I, I think panelists work really hard and, um, just to thank the Rasmussen Foundation. I mean, they're one of the few places where I have been paid adequately for my work. And it's it's really a delight as a panelist to um, to have that. So just seconding how hard panelists work and how the work is heartbreaking sometimes. Yeah, are there other thoughts on that and misconceptions about panels that people would wanna share? Yeah. Um I thought the Rasmussen panel that I served on last year, this year, uh, was unique uh, in that that the submissions were not so much about the art, but about the need to make art. In that, uh, a lot of the submissions were I need money to repair the roof of my art studio. I mean, the art alone was wonderful, but it wasn't, you know, I need to buy paint and I need to, you know, get to a studio or stuff. But, and somebody else saying, uh, I need money so I can pay the rent for three months so I can concentrate on my work. Or I need money to get a larger space to make my Umiak canoe. Uh, it's, it's those intangibles that go into the art and how it would impact the lives of people in your community, for example how it would impact the culture that you represent. Uh, and I also think that in a proposal, don't be afraid of putting your heart in your proposal and not so much the line items that are required for the proposal. Thank you, Michael. Anika. Yeah, I'm trying to see where to add. I agree with what everyone has said. And just to piggyback with Michael around impact. And I think um, that's something that I'm looking for. And I would encourage people not to shy away from what is the impact. We are in a time, in a wonderful time, where impact and community have just as much weight, if not more, than the art itself, where resources and process are just as much or 
uh, and the artists themselves and their well-being are 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 quite frankly more important than the artwork um, from my point of view. And so I've I love seeing like Russ Newson and some others changing the tide, changing the language. Um, so you should consider that. I would say even when you look at applications, if it feels like a square, you're a circle trying to fit into a square, that application may not be for you and that's okay. I think it's worthwhile to know who you are and value what you bring and know if an organization is not ready for you. And I know that that's hard because mm. needs, so I'm not getting away from that, but I just, you know, let's try to maybe have strike the balance. You are worth, you're worthy. Um, any organization would be lucky to have you as a recipient. I wanna put that out there for everyone. I love that, Anika, because I think there's unpaid labor of, of doing the application itself, right, as an artist. And we have to think about how to value our time um, and where to allot that time. Um, and if we're only uh, spending our energy to applying, then, you know, whether it be just even surviving, you know, maybe we need to be putting our energy on surviving as well. Those are great points. Thank you so much. Um, I'm before we're going to kind of now move into talking a little bit about what it's like to be on a panel and how uh, how to evaluate different parts of an application. And I just wanted to ask you, I, and this was something that I know that in my experience uh, uh, as a panelist on numerous panels, um, I have different approaches than my colleagues. How do you start looking at a packet of information? Because usually these applications, whether it's to the Rasmussen or another foundation or another opportunity, you have different parts. You might have a statement, a CV, a work sample body, um, and there might be other questions that you have to answer. Where do you start looking um, when you when you begin um, evaluating an artist packet? And what feels the most important, perhaps, from those to you? And I know that everyone is going to probably have different answers to that. Sorry. Well, for yeah. me, yeah, for me, the, um, as a practicing artist, I'm, I'm, I, I can't, I want to see the work. That's the first thing that I want to look at. Um, but um, absolutely, what I do is first make sure that I'm well versed on the mandates and the what am I looking for when I start opening these up. What should I have a, um, an eye out for? What What is the application about? So for instance, with the Rasmussen, um, there were different levels of um, whether you have an emerging artist and professional artists. Um, and then in, somewhere else, you know, the, the category someone's applying to is only professional artists, right? So you, you need to really know, be primed with what is it that you're going to be keeping an eye out for? What sort of things should you be looking at um, and things that uh, that fit or don't? But then when I open an application, I want to look at the samples of work and I'm a visual artist. So I'm, I'm talking about looking at the visuals of someone's work. I want to get right in there um, because I think that the work is has to be autonomous. It has to stand on its own. And I don't want to go in with a bias, whether it's positive or negative, depending on what's written about the work. I want the work to communicate to me as it should, as an autonomous object whether it's a painting or a sculpture or installation. Um, so I want to really like look at that, get get what I can from the images of that. And, and then, so that for me is the most important part. And then the second most important is then to go and read the artist statement or the personal statement, whatever it's called in that application, where the artist is talking about their process and the things that they're thinking about and imbuing the work with. And for me, that those two things should be in dialogue. They should complement each other. They should be in sync. That when I read about the work, it enriches the work. It supports the work. If I read that and I don't see it in the in the work itself, or vice versa, I find that that would be problematic. Um, so those two are the most important things for me when I get into a, a package. So this is something that I want to take back to misconceptions. I don't know if it's a common misconception, but folks may have a thought that, oh, all reviewers are the same. They think the same. And I just want to say that because I am completely opposite of what Sharon said in many ways, right? I look at the artist statement first. I look at the work sample last. As a performing artist, 
I and what I like about Rasmussen, and that comes back to I think I'm gonna harp on, you know, finding the opportunity that really fits you. Rasmussen, we were able to select um, areas of expertise and for ourselves. So I was able to do interdisciplinary and music, you know, largely. So I was really able to engulf myself in the sound. I um, I was overwhelmed. I sat right here in my office, like, I can't believe I get to listen to this. Like this, there's such amazing music. Um, but all that to say, I do, I want to know who the person is first, how they see themselves and in this, in the world, in their space, in their community. So I do look at the artist statement first. I look at whatever's on the page. Sometimes it depends, and I can't remember Rasmussen, but sometimes you're able to give your website and things like that. For me, that's the last thing I might do. I'm looking for everything on the pages that were provided to um, speak to me. Um, some, some applications say, yes, feel free to go to the website, but you have to remember that we have finite amount of time, depending on the applications. One a uh, review I'm doing right now, I'm reading five applications. I've had mo up to a hundred before or 50. So just think about, you know, how, how someone's energy can be drained. So how is that application capturing me? Who are you? And do you know who you are? And that's what I, I look for in the artist statement. Thanks. Yeah. Well, like Sharon, I look at the, um, the artwork first, um, reading or whatever it is, painting, slides, whatever. Um, and, and then I'm, I, when I'm looking at the written material, what I'm really looking for is a sense that the artist really is invested in this, that they really have a passion and a commitment. Um, and that's the most important thing to me. You know, if I'm looking at somebody's resume and they have a lot of awards, um, that's great. But what I'm more interested in seeing is, you know, are they working consistently on their art? Are they pushing themselves? Do they have an ongoing practice? Um, so those are all things that are important to me. Well, I look at the artist's statement first. Uh, look at the artwork. Uh, lastly, I look at the budget. And I guess that's because I'm a museum director by trade. Uh, and I guess also because I was a, a college professor, is it well written? Does it really clarify. And I think one of the, you know, as a museum director, we submitted lots of proposals to NEH and NEA, and we passed it around amongst various departments to check the grammar, to make sure they understood. And, you know, the accountants even read our proposals. And so, Give it to a friend. Give it to somebody who, you know, your next door neighbor and make sure that they understand what you're trying to do. And that happens. And then rely on the fact that the Rasmussen staff previews it before it gets to the reviewers that decide who gets the money. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And I think those it's wonderful to just hear these different approaches and also to say there are a million for the approaches we just heard, there are a million other approaches that people have. Um, I've had colleagues that immediately Google someone first. I have had colleagues that start with the budget. I have people that start with the CV that I know. So definitely, you know, there are a million approaches. And I think that that's a really it's great to hear, though, um, how you all approach uh, beginning to go through a packet. And I want to kind of 
walk through the parts of a typical application really for any kind of opportunity for the, for the most part and just ask for your thoughts about what what makes them shine and strong um so i'd love to start with the artist statement or personal statement um they go by a variety of names. Usually it's the opportunity you have to say who you are and why you do what you do. Um, and uh, I, you've had a couple of ideas have already come up about looking for something that supports, that's in relationship to um, the whatever the kind of packet of, of artwork or work samples of whatever medium they might be, um, that that is a relationship. But what are some other ways that we might strengthen our personal or artist statements um, for review panels? What are some things that really make them stand out to you when you see a great personal statement? Or just, statement? Yeah, go for it. Start with a nitpicky of, you know, spell check, grammar check, and to Michael's point, have a neighbor read it or whatever it is, or someone who's got fresh eyes, because now your eyes are glazed over um, having written it and looked at it a few times. So get someone else's eyes on it, make sure there's no typos, because that that can be, that can just create an obstacle, a bias even, let me dare say, um, because we we have these biases. And so how can I level a really uh, the playing field? A, a simple way is to make sure that your language is clear without errors, um, that your grammar is correct. And I would say um, also your language is is plain. I don't know how, I don't know, have a better word. I'm, I'm not looking for a lot of jargon. Um, I would want, I would say, yeah, your neighbor, or if you were at, a cookout or, you know, what, or you're, you're telling your grandma, because all of us have struggled to tell our grandma or, you know, our parents, like what we do. So how would you explain it to them? Right. So be really clear about who you are. Use simple language. Um, yes. Connect it to your work. And ideally, if you really know who you are, all of those things are going to come together. So I think I would really encourage you to ask yourself, who am I? Who do I want to be? How do I want to present myself? Just in general, just do that sort of as your own practice. And as you uh, develop applications, you're going to find that they're going to come across um, more confident. Um, and we can, we can read that. Um, it comes through. I'll pause. Yeah. There's and I would also, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to pass the mic to you, Anne. <laughs> okay. I would also add that, um, you know, I'm, I'm always interested when people can show me that their work has been developing. Um, if they can talk about, um, you know, this is kind of where I began and this is the direction I'm going in. And also if they can talk about how they relate to an artistic tradition, to a community, those are also really vital for me. Um, and again, I so agree, don't do the jargon. You know, when we talk about an artistic tradition, you're not writing a graduate school paper, just, you know, keep it, keep it simple, but give me a sense that you comprehend your work, that you kind of know how it fits in with other people's work, that you're part of an ongoing, that you're part of an artistic community in some way. And I so agree about spell check, I mean, you know, I'm spending all this time going over an application and it seems like somebody didn't even bother to run spell check. It just, it feels disrespectful. And um, so just as much as you can and uh, absolutely show it to somebody else. I also think when you submit photographs of your work, they need to be done the best that you can do. Not just the night before, uh, but the best that you can do. And that doesn't mean that you need to go out and hire a professional photographer. But, you know, you know a friend who does the best photographs amongst your friends and get them in and photograph your work. And that you can submit. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, perhaps that's a good segue to, to move. We can jump to talking about work sample, the work sample packet. Usually for um, for these opportunities, we, we submit more than one um, thing that we've made for people to look at. So I wonder, um, you know, other insights, uh, Michael just spoke to the, the need for the best photography that you have access to um, or, or mode of documentation, because certainly maybe I know I make performance work as well, Anika, that, you know, maybe you have other modalities, the best recording, fidelity recording, or the best um, fidelity video um, that you might be able to capture of your work. Um, are there other insights that you all have about that work sample packet? Um, what you look for in a really strong work sample packet? Um, what are some things that have stood out to you perhaps in the past? Or, or if you create your own work sample packets, what do you try to strive for when you're pulling them together? Um. Well, I'll speak from the um, from the visual art uh, angle. Um, I think it's a, a, a really good for I agree. Take the best photos that you can. I mean, cameras these days, there are, are cell phones. They have pretty good cameras. If that's what you have, you can um, you can do a good job with those. Um, just eliminate the glare and the shadows and um, don't use crazy filters so that the work doesn't resemble the, the thing in real life. Um, but uh, it, it, you have a limit. There's almost always a limit of how many images you can submit. Um, so don't don't select things that are disparate that 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 don't seem to connect to each other. Show us that you you have a body of work that you um, you have something that you're working towards. It can be a different media, but have something that connects them. Something that we can see that's connecting the the images that you're showing us. Um, and one thing that I've learned in my own experience that's really helpful for panels and juries is to show at least one image of your work installed somewhere. Even though your images have the size and they should be able to imagine what it looks like on a wall or in a space, it really helps to have an installation shot, at least one. It really helps the, the panel to contextualize your work and to understand its relationship to the, the human body and, and, and your uh, um, how you would sense it and feel it and experience it in a space. Uh, so I would say that those are some of the most important things that I would say about a submission package. You have limited images, so make them work for you. Um, and that I would hearken that back also to your, your artist statement or personal statement. Usually there's a word limit. Make every word and sentence work for you. Don't throw any way, any statement away like, I, I, I'm, I want you to understand my thoughts and feelings or I'm expressing myself. All artists are doing that. Please don't waste any time writing that. You have one paragraph sometimes. Tell me, why are you making the thing? Go from the concrete to the abstract, right? Sometimes these are so abstract that someone's saying, um, you know, I'm, I want you to understand how I feel about life. That's too big. Um, if you tell me I'm using these colors because they express and then you fill in the abstract, I can go, aha, the concrete thing I see in your image, I now understand and I can connect it to your statement. Tell me how they connect. Thank you. Yeah. Other thoughts about work samples? We had someone ask uh, in in the chat about, you know, what if you're an artist, and perhaps this is a good one for you, Anika, who works across a variety of different media, um, how do you, if you're an interdisciplinary artist, and since you reviewed that, that section, um, how do you decide what to include? You know, I know I myself, I'm, I write, I make visual work and installation, I do performance and music. And how do I, how, you know, how, how do I decide what to include in my work sample packet if I work across a variety of media? Yeah, I think my expectation in reviewing interdisciplinary is that one work will have multiple disciplines, right? So if it's, uh, yeah, there'll be visual aspects, there'll be, there'll be sound, there'll be, you know, there'll be a lots of different stimuli. And so, um, and representation of your artist, artistic practice. So that would be my expectation. Not that you would have separate uh, disciplines represented in your, in your work to that question. Um, I do agree, like you should, I wanna just like harp on 
the quality um, and also like be really cautious in how I express that too, because I have problems with that word quality. However, I agree, like the cell phone quality these days is just so strong. You can get a good sound out of it. You can get a good picture out of it. That said, if you do have that said, if you do have access to someone who's a photographer, a professional photographer, or a sound person, that's great. Now, if you don't remember that the bias then can come in because my ear is going to be wowed by the quality. I can tell you right now because I go to shows and when the sound's not right, I can't, I can't, I can't listen. I want to, I go to the bathroom. I just can't take it. Um, so, you know, those things, you know, just do the very best that you can. That said, Rasmussen is wonderful because as, um, Sharon was saying, there's the level of emerging, emerging and seasoned or different levels. And so if you're emerging and you clearly have used, you know, a cell phone or, that type of thing. We will take those things. We'll be able to balance some of that. So that's really important. And if you are more seasoned, there is an expectation. Um, there will be some level of expectation about your um, what you the quality of your your work. Yeah, I think those are all great points. I um, I would just add as a former panelist myself, sometimes if you really don't have access to a resource, um, it's it's something you can bring up in whether it be in, in some some of the written narrative. Um, there's sometimes it's useful um, to very briefly and wisely um, choose your words concisely to share um, that you that you don't have access to professional photography in your remote location um, of this work or something of that nature. Uh, it can be a useful uh, piece of information for a panelist as well to that end. Um, we can sorry, keep- can I say one thing about that? Sorry, yeah. Michael was mentioning about, I, you know, I will never forget a proposal that said, I need to build a studio. Like that was it. That was the whole paragraph. And for me, as someone who does not live in a remote area, that was so important for that artist to paint a picture of their need, where they are. So just to piggyback on what Hollis is saying, like, don't be afraid to give us your context, particularly yeah. if you're rural, remote, whatever the case may be. We, some of us are very urban and we don't get it. We don't assume it until you tell us. But I love, even though I'm an urban girl, I want to hear that. I want, I'm like, yes, that person in the middle of, I don't know where is now going to have access like they never had before. That's, that's exciting as a reviewer. I think the most powerful proposal that I read was the one that started off with, I want to change the ecology of the bay that I live on. For that, they wanted a heavy duty sewing machine in order to make otter skin gloves and scarves. Wow. But to change the ecology of her homeland, the bay that she was raised in, that her people were in, to change the ecology through art. Wow. That's powerful. That's very powerful. And I think this is such a great segue because, you know, all of these parts of an application, you know, relate to one another. So let's talk a little bit about project statements and the opportunities that artists have to make those, um, you know, it's uh, it's different, right, than the art, the artist statement or the personal statement where we say who we are and why we do what we do. This is the opportunity to say, here's what I want to do with this money or this residency or this fellowship. Um so what makes that part of the application really shine for you um, as a reviewer? And I, I think I see you unmuting. Yeah, um, I would say be really specific and concrete. Um, you know, I, we're, we're artists or so we're in the arts world and we know that sometimes people start to work on a project and it changes and, and that's fine. But I do want to have a sense of 
uh, of, of concreteness. If somebody has a plan, I know the plan may change, but they have a plan. Um, and also that it's reasonable to do. Um, you know, I, I go back to that application that you were just talking about, Michael, and I also, that application really stood out for me too. And part of it was, I wanna change the ecology of the bay where I live, but then it got really concrete. This is how I'm gonna do it. Um, and so I think both to have like a, a broad vision, but also to be able to talk really concretely about how you're gonna bring that vision into the world. Yeah, thank you. Do others have thoughts about project statements and things they look for? Anika, I think I saw you unmute. Oh, oh. share yeah, yes, my oh. <laughs> oh. I second that. I think that um, you know, being really concrete about about your idea. Um, and also, this is something that we've talked about already um, today, but to go back again and show your proposal to other people, do they understand what you're talking about? Um, does it make sense to them? Um, you know, and, and sometimes we, we put so much into these things that it, it can feel really personal, um, but, but try to take the feedback people give you. You know, you, you obviously have the, the right to take it or not, but it can be really helpful. Um, I, I know that often we're told uh, at art school, write it as if you're, you know, is it so that your parents can understand or your grandparents or your neighbor. Um, and, and the meaning behind that, the, the idea behind that is that somebody maybe that's not completely um, uh, in your world can understand what the proposal is. What are you talking about? What are you actually going to do? Um, the other thing that I think is really important is that in some way you show or tell the jury that you can accomplish the thing you're proposing. If you propose something that just is not um, uh, represented in your images or, or in your CV, I've, you know, if you propose you're going to paint a mural and I see no evidence you've done it before, at least tell me that you are going to uh, apprentice with someone who's a mural painter or something like that. So really show me that you can accomplish what you're telling me that you'd like to do. If there's no connection, because obviously we're all reaching ahead and further and we want to do things we haven't necessarily done before. Show me you're prepared to do what you say you're going to do in the proposal. I would definitely agree with everything that's been said. And I'm thinking about um, the project statement, now the concreteness, and I'm looking, can this really be done in the time period of the grant? That ties me to the budget too. Have they, do they have a realistic budget so that they can get this done in the time period of the grant? The budget is gonna tell on you when it comes to that um, and how detailed or not you are with that. If you say 100 bucks for this, 200 for that, you know, just very, I don't know. I don't, I wish I had something, had looked at something in advance, but. Um, if there's just a difference, if your budget is very vague and your project is very vague, then it makes me think that you have not thought this through. And if you haven't thought something through, the likelihood that it's going to be successful feels like it's less. Now, all of us wing it in life. Oh, we're just going to go do something. And sometimes it turns out great. But remember, this is a competitive process and there's people who are going to be exceptionally thorough with what they present. And we've read 20, 30, 40, 50 of these. So that is going to stand out when you're more concrete, thorough, plain language, and your project matches your budget and it can happen in a year if, if the time period is a year. Yeah, I recall one budget that absolutely said I'm taking a month off because the salmon run is going to happen. That was realistic. Yeah, definitely. I mean, maybe this is a good segue into, but, you know, we're sort of in budgets um, about, you know, we're talking about concrete that we've spent time researching and really kind of getting a sense of what, what we're asking for uh, when there's a budget as a, as a component of an application process. Are there other things that, you know, make a budget uh, feel like a really strong component of an application that should, you know, that might help make the difference between that application um, getting, getting a, uh, of receiving an award or not. 
I think the comment from the Rasmussen Foundation to all of us was, do not worry about the high cost of transportation of equipment to remote areas. So applicants, don't worry about that because you've got legitimate costs. Don't worry because those of us down in the lower 48, you know, we look at something like $2,500 to get a sewing machine in. Well, that's a realistic cost. So kudos to the Rasmussen Foundation for advising us of that. You know, I'd like to add, though, not every foundation gives you the kind of really thorough background that we get from Rasmussen. So I would absolutely assume that this person doesn't know anything, that the panelists don't know anything about what life in Alaska is like, and that I want to, like, work that into my narrative at some point to say, I know this seems high, and this is why. Um, you know, the other thing I look for in a budget is, are artists getting paid? Um, I mean, I really, I want to see people paying themselves and, and paying maybe collaborators so that we're not um, stuck in that thing of working for nothing. Um, and that's important for me to see in a budget. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. So um, I think what we'll, we'll um, transition into some final one or two final questions that I have. But I think there's one that's worth asking kind of now as we talk about money and opportunity um, that's come up, uh, which is just about the tendency to fund artists who might have great need and then artists who have had access to a lot of resources and therefore can show and create um really well-documented work and have maybe had a lot of opportunity and sort of the tension between serving both of these maybe ends of the spectrum and the middle of the spectrum may or may not be uh, receiving the same degree of applications. There's just a question sort of someone musing on that, thinking about, you know, y'all's reflections as panelists on uh, whether or not you maybe have experienced that yourself or or seen it um, and and what, what we can do to maybe mitigate some of that tension, um, both from the inside and the outside. I, you know, this is a hard one because like Anne was saying, Ras Rasmussen is unique. Um, and having the emerging and seasoned and mid-career, I think is the one, um, options is really, really helpful. I haven't come across many um, grant processes that are um, as intentional around that. And so, um, so that does put us in a position as reviewers of, who does really have the need? So if we have those categories, then I'm, it's apples to apples, right? Um, but if not, um, in terms of experience, but if not, what happens? Yeah, resources are finite. And so I will just say, uh, as a commissioner locally, there is a now regional Tony Award winning theater that stopped getting, stopped applying for local funds because they knew that the volunteer theater company, like, re, and, uh, you know, and others that are coming up, coming up in the ranks needed those resources. And then they now have access to NEA funds and other funds, um, private um, donors and so on that others don't have access to. So I think as an artist, Sometimes you you it's interesting it's an interesting thing to think about like where am I where do I fit in this program um, how many how many times have I gotten this before what would be a, a a next phase for me how can I start to support others who are coming along take it leave it but you know it's just something to think about thank you Anika yeah it's a challenging question to be sure. Um, and definitely a tension that operates at many levels um, and layers of complexity. Um, before we uh, sort of turn to the, a couple more questions, and I just want to encourage audience members to populate the ask a question function with uh, questions that are coming up for you. I wanted to ask um, 
two last questions. Um, one's already been addressed, which was how do you how do you recommend that as you're finalizing the packet, how do you get help? Um, what what kind of final steps um, before you press submit um, alone in your room? At, you know. 11:59 but but before the 12 o'clock deadline um what 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 are the what you've got your beautiful budget and project statement work samples you're feeling really strong about them what um what should happen between there and pressing submit any other thoughts or contributions we talked about having neighbors or people who are unfamiliar with your work um review it uh are there any other other thoughts uh, beyond spell check which i have to wholeheartedly agree with um it really matters to feel like time has been taken um i would say that that something that can be really helpful is to look up the artist statements of of artists out there um it can be someone that you know or you don't know it can be helpful if it's someone who works in the same kind of way that you do that you feel some synchronicity with but it can be really educational to read other people's statements um and and look at their work and say okay how do these match up and what kind of things are other artists and professional artists that are maybe uh further along on their career path than I am. What are they saying in their statements? I think it can be really helpful to have a sense of what other people are saying in theirs and, and, and give you some ideas for your own. There are, if you have access to the, the internet, there are also lots of sites you can go to that kind of help you um, with a list of questions for your, your art statement that will help you to write one as well. So there are resources out there. Um, it can be uh, a little bit daunting, uh, you know, to put into words your, your practice, but there are resources and especially helpful to look at what other people have done. That, that's great wisdom, Sharon. Thank you. Any other thoughts on guidance for those last steps? I'll ask this question. Oh, Anne, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, and follow the rules. I mean, I when we were doing the reviewing for this round of applicants, you know, the, uh, the instruction was to have a one page resume. And somebody submitted a resume that was, I believe, 12 pages long. And out of fairness to other artists, I'm only going to read the first page. And um, so just really simple, but it's something that people often kind of forget, which is if people want to say they want a one page resume, they want a one page resume and figure out how to get your resume into one page. And if people say, um, you know, a work sample of 30 pages, you know, for literature, and you send 60 pages, it's um, 30 pages that are going to get read. So um, to just be aware that you're on a team, you're and play fair with the other with the other people who are on the team. I wanted to ask this question because I think we've all um, both rejected folks that we wish we could give awards to, and also perhaps for those of us who have applied, been rejected many times. Um, so I wonder if we could, you know, what are your words of wisdom for that moment where you receive rejection from an opportunity you were really excited about, um, or for artists that you know you wish you could have given an award to but but couldn't due to a variety of factors how to rebound from that moment i mean uh it's okay to take a moment and have a moment right and then i would remind myself it doesn't really help but you know, again, there's finite resources and it's not personal. I think we started with that, but it's going to feel personal. This is your passion. Um, and, you know, I think get right back up again, get right back up. I do think asking for feedback is good if it's available, but if you're asking for feedback, um, I want you to think about the feedback that you wanted when you wrote it. Because if you just call the organization, and I say this as a grant maker now, if you call the organiza organization and say, I'd like to have feedback, 
it's so general and we obviously have to protect the anonym, uh, anonymity of the reviewers and that type of thing. Um, but if you could figure out a very specific question, like, sorry, I'm so used to being in Zoom, I'm looking at the chat and there's this question there around, um, like you want to expand, you've been doing a, a certain thing a certain way for a while and now maybe you want to bend genres or something, that's what I'm getting from this question. And so um, say that one and um, you know anticipate that when you're writing and then when you come back, you can ask a specific question like that one. Did that have any impact? Because I had a historic um, um, arts practice, you know, for some time, and then I, you know, wanted to go into this new approach or new work. Um, did that have any impact on my application? For me, I can ask, I can answer that um, as a grant maker um, in a in a clearer way than than a broad question because. Broadly speaking, we just don't have enough money for everyone. <laughs> so that's what it comes down to. Um, so I would add to that, um, it, it's it's difficult and it, and it probably won't be right away, but I think it's a good idea to try to be curious about why you were rejected. And um, uh, if you can get feedback and not not every uh, host is going to going to give that to you, but if you can um, take it, um, maybe give yourself a bit of time before you read it, but be curious about the feedback that you get. You are allowed to take it on or not. Um, that's that's your uh, prerogative, but uh, it can be helpful to understand why your application was rejected. And sometimes it's simply because there were just too many excellent applications and someone fell into a priority category and maybe you did not or something like that. Um, so I think being curious about it and also uh, another thing that was mentioned earlier, but was this the right project for you? Was this the right application? Um, you know, because I think that especially as you go on as an artist, um, saying no to certain things can sometimes be more important than things you say yes to. Um, resources are finite, including your time and energy and so on. So r really think about whether it was the right application, the right time for you and so on. Um, and, and, and then finally, I would say, ask yourself, what does success look like for me? You know, um, for some people, success represents one thing or another. Be honest with yourself about what success looks like for you and then work towards those things instead of sort of a scattershot uh, for everything, right? So there you can find where your satisfaction is as an artist. And hopefully it's in making art no matter what happens out there and what things you get and what you don't get. Um, and also, I tell people all the time, like new artists, if you get 10 rejections to every one acceptance, you're doing great. Um, it's the name of the game. Yeah. yeah. I would I would add, uh, you never know what's going on in a panel or on the, the granting agencies in. And that maybe that they received 20 applications the year before on exactly what you are applying for. And they awarded 50% of those. So along you come with in the same genre and they decide that they're going to move in a different direction. So it's not you but it's what happened a year before and it's not your art. And then my suggestion, sit down in a chair, put on a good piece of music and just relax and know that you are, you gave it your best shot and go on with your art. Yeah. Such good advice. Um, I'll add that uh, just which is also to answer another question that's come up around um, service on panels. Uh, the Rasmussen panelists rotate every year. Uh, so it's a new group of people reviewing your work. And so my injunction is that if you do not get the uh, Rasmussen or in another award um, that you apply again. Um, usually the panels rotate. There are some foundations where uh, 
and opportunities where it's the same reviewers uh, or organizational members every year. Uh, but that's an opportunity for you to rewrite and improve your application for those. But um, many times it's a it's a new group of people. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't revisit your application if it got rejected uh, to enhance it, make it better, and also reconsider if that project is something that is right for you in this next moment the following year, because maybe your life has changed or circumstances have changed for you as well. Um, so that's just to answer that that first question about um, panelists uh, reviewing um, multiple times uh, and, and considering past awardees. That changes organization to organization and opportunity to opportunity. So Rasmus and as like we've been saying, it's not uh, a rule. Um, I, maybe we can open out some of these uh, other remaining questions. I think I'll maybe tie these two questions together. One is sort of if you are working to select from your work samples, you've got disparate work samples. Um, all I, I think um, maybe in writing, we sometimes talk about like our babies, right? Like these are our, um, and it's sometimes hard to kill your darlings and decide between them. How, are there tips for how to decide between all of your favorite work samples? Um, and then uh, similarly, if you're looking to propose something that maybe um, expands or changes the scope of your your work um, versus kind of continuing along your path uh, as an artist, um, as you've been, the trajectory you've been crafting for yourself. Do you have thoughts about um, how to select work samples uh, when you have a variety of ideas uh, to consider? And then also maybe similarly and in parallel, um, when you're putting forward a project, um, one that's going to change your trajectory or one that's going to further it. Uh, if there's a preference or approach that you might suggest for artists as they're crafting their intentions around the, the statements and work. Well, I would say that if you're, um, so sort of the second half, if you're changing the trajectory of your work, I would say um, that what's really important is if if the work is going to be radically different, show me in some way in the application that you've thought about it, that you're prepared, you're doing preparatory work. Um, show me that you have seen projects through, that you, that, you know, if you can show me the arc of starting a project and, and, and learning and finishing it, then if you're proposing something to me that, that you haven't done before, but I see the steps you're taking to prepare. If in your proposal you're saying, I've taken a class to learn how to do this, or I've researched uh, where there's a foundry, or et cetera, et cetera. If you show me that you have prepared for this and that you that you understand the, the complexity of this new thing that you're that you want to enter into, um, maybe it's also, uh, you know, it's a different medium, but you've really got a handle on the theoretical backing that continues through in this new project. In some ways, show me this consistency and this planning that even though it's 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 a, a new project, a new thing that you that you hope to do, that I can see that you're going to take your expertise and skills and knowledge into this new thing. I think that would be really important when somebody is going to completely change their their career or their trajectory. Thank you. And I would add to that. Um, I mean, I'm always interested in seeing artists who are pushing themselves, who are not kind of content to keep doing what they do well, um, who are willing to like take a risk. And um, so, I mean, I agree to like let people know this is how I'm going to take the risk. But to me, it's always really exciting when an artist is taking a risk, when they're moving into a new area, when they're doing something, when they're opening themselves up to the possibility of failure, you know, but I, I feel like it's going to be an interesting failure. Um, and who and it might be a great success. Yeah. Are um are there other thoughts? I think I would say just to the individual who's thinking about work sample selection. Um, this is a great time to invite your neighbor over again. Um, to talk a little bit about uh, if you're if you 
are having a hard time selecting between your seven darlings for your five slots, um, what what speak you know what might translate to someone else um, beyond yourself uh, is another great way to think about that work sample selection, um, and I think also what speaks to the project that you're offering forward uh, is also a useful way perhaps to to do that, which folks are talking about just now, especially if you're expanding beyond yourself, if you're you know, if you have something that's more formative that relates relates to that trajectory, I think that's that's useful. Um, there was one other question I wanted to address around uh, re uh, receiving awards previously, and this is, um, I think, in specific relationship to the Rasmussen. Um, and there are um, the Rasmussen has given awards to people who have received awards in the past. Um, so that isn't a barrier to reapplying to the Rasmussen. Though there is a period between which receiving awards on reapplication. Um, and you can see all those details on the website and the Rasmussen um, via Kara, Karen Lowell uh, has a, a great uh, email address for specific questions about the 2023 um, application process. So that's a great place around um, uh, questions about collaboration, specific questions around collaborative applications and things like that as well. Um, so as we come to a close, I just wanted to give an opportunity to our panelists for anything that we feel like we haven't addressed that you just wanted to say or state um, as we close out. Uh, any, any final thoughts or words that you might want to, to offer? the listeners and, and viewers this afternoon? I would just, uh, um, to the work sample thing first, I want to say, show us your layers. And I say this um, more from the performing arts point of view, more from the music point of view, really. I don't know how this translates as well, specifically to visual arts. Um, but if all your songs sound the same, we hear that, right? And so switch it up, show us layers and levels. Um, and that can simply be in um, the speed of the music. You know, it, it can be so many things. The key, if the key is like very similar, if you have, you know, um, a song that's got a lot of minors and then another that's major, this is just does different things to the ear. So I would encourage that variety as much as you, as much as you can. Um, try, and then my, my final just sort of word of wisdom is just be kind to yourself as an artist. Actually, I didn't plan to say this. This time of year can be a difficult time for all of us. Um, be kind to yourself, right? Take some time for yourself. Self-care. I did a bubble bath the other night. When last, right? So whatever that looks like for you please, please take care of yourself. Any other final thoughts or words that people want to offer? Um, well, I would say that one of the things that you should know, um, and especially with the panel for, for Rasmussen was how passionately people cared about your applications and who you are, how carefully people read them, how much people advocated for you. Um, it, it, I, it was amazing. Um, and, and really, uh, especially with, with this panel, how much people wanted to find the best and help um, and with their with the written feedback and so on. So just so you know, um, people really care and people were advocating and and we were having discussions. So it's not a it's not a um, an, an unemotional thing that and just ticking boxes. It was it, it was really um, it meant a lot to people um, and and we care about you. So let your application um, reflect that. Uh, be specific. Tell us really about you, about the work, really concrete. Your your ideas can be abstract, but connect them to the thing that you're making um, and tell us about why you're doing what you're doing and why you need certain things realistically, concretely. Help us see you um, because people, they really cared a lot. So I would just want you to know that, that people were really fighting for you. Thank you for those lovely words. Um, 
I just want to say thank you to Anne, Michael, Anika, and Sharon for their time today. And uh, we're right here at 1.30. And, and I want to just remind folks that, you know, there's so much wisdom today uh, that was shared. And perhaps you had a friend that you wish you could share this with. The good news is that link that you used to click on today to be here is a, a direct link to the recording. So you can share that with others. Um, you can rewatch it, fast forward, catch that phrase, um, go back to specific parts um, of today's conversation. A reminder that the 2023 application is not currently open um, and the content uh, on the website, the Rasmussen's website will be updated around the 15th. Um, that will have the application and guideline, but you can um, look at the resources and toolkits that can be found on the rasmussen.org website for and the drop down to individual artist awards. Um, the application will open on December the 15th and close on March the 1st. And there's an advanced review deadline of February the 14th. Um, and this is to ensure eligibility and base criteria. It's not a content review, but it really is a, a useful moment, um, especially to just ensure you have all the pieces of your application in place place, then there's nothing kind of functional about your application that's going to take you out of the running. Um, and this is also the 20th year of the awards. So it's a really incredible opportunity. Um, I was just speaking with an artist the other day about this really remarkable amount of funding and generosity of funding that this opportunity represents. And also the care that's given to this process is really unique, um, as I can say as a panelist and then someone who's been working with the Rasmussen to support this professional development um, addition to the contribution to our community. So I uh, I really want to celebrate the opportunity this offers and encourage you to keep applying um, relentlessly to this and other opportunities. Thank you again, Anne, Michael, and Anika, and Sharon. Um, and uh, we hope that this has been useful for you. There'll be future opportunities um, coming from the Rasmussen and otherwise. So keep your eye on the Rasmussen website and Facebook page um, for future events for the general public um, that help support this application process. Um, it looks like Karen's providing a little bit more information in the chat and she's provided a, an email address earlier as well. So thank you everyone. Um, we'll let you enjoy uh, the rest of your afternoons or evenings, wherever you may be. Um, and thank you again. And good luck with all of your endeavors.